Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast. The history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and The Birth of the Russian Empire. And Episode 21, Before the Rus Part 2, Bulgars, Chuvash, Magyars, and Pechenegs. This episode is a brief look at the Bulgars before the Rus, and an introduction to some of the other significant peoples in the region. We are still in the age of scant and contradictory sources, arguments over which archaeological remains belong to who, and long-winded debates over linguistic reconstructions. But we are getting ever closer to the point where our story starts to become a coherent narrative. Just like in the case of the Slavs, we have very limited sources on the Bulgars, and their history during this period has to be pieced together from breadcrumbs of evidence. To put it in the simplest terms, what we do know is this. There was a great Bulgaria on the Pontic steppe. It collapsed under pressure from the Khazars. A body of Bulgarians moved west to found what would become Bulgaria on the Danube, while the rest of the Bulgarians became subjects of the Khazars. At some point, or points, as it seems likely there was more than one wave, they moved north into the central Volga region. And then, 300 years later, Ibn Fadlin arrived in Volga, Bulgaria, as an ambassador from the Caliphate, to make the first written record of what was already a thriving, substantially, if not entirely Muslim, Khanis dominating the region, although it still paid tribute to the Khazars and chafed at their control. Of course, if Volga Bulgaria was already there with a Khan, cities, international trade, and everything else that Ibn Fadlan described, it had not just appeared overnight at the beginning of the 10th century. Archaeological remains show the Bulga state beginning to form around a hundred years before that which leaves us with about 100-150 years of speculation and guesswork over how they got from the Black Sea to the Forest Steppe Belt, where, by the time Ibn Fadlin arrived, Volga Bulgaria was an established power he describes as having 500,000 households, a figurative number, but one that indicates a substantial population. If you're keeping track of the narrative, You'll have noticed that this period also more or less lines up with the Slavs consolidating into the Rus. And if you recall our discussion of trade in the Khazar Khayanate, and how there was a major shift in the routes from Khazaria to Bulgaria, you might be wondering whether these two things were related. Well, spoiler alert, they were. Like the Slavs becoming the Rus, the transformation of the Bulgars from semi-nomadic steppe tribe to major political power, was catalyzed by the arrival of the Vikings, known in the East as Variagi, or Varangians. But that part of the story is still ahead of us. Today, we're going to have a look at what we know, or think we know, about that before period, and some of the Bulgars' neighbours in the region. The archaeological record in the region shows that it was already inhabited. Lying where the forest belt meets the steppe, we have evidence of several cultures. Along the Kama, we have Finno-Ugrian settlements. South, towards the steppe, we have Saltive settlements, similar to those we have already discussed further west in the Ukrainian steppe. As in the West, these settlements represented steppe peoples turning to the sedentary life. West of the Volga, we find the remains of the Imenkova culture, which has variously been attributed to Slavs, Turkic and Finno-Ugrian peoples, with the interpretation sometimes varying for political reasons, and at some point we will have to have an episode covering that subject. Some historians place the Magyars in the area that is now Bashkortostan at this time. But there is not a complete consensus on the subject, 
A number of historians also believed that there had already been Turkic migration into the whole of the Volga Ural region by the time the Bulgars arrived. So they were not the first Turkic speaking peoples in the region. Some scholars argue that Hunnic groups speaking a language related to Chuvash were present, although others counter that the Huns spoke an Eastern Iranian language. Linguists place the appearance of Turkic loanwords in the Finno Ugrian languages of the Volga region at no earlier than the 7th century. Similar analysis of Turkic loans in Hungarian put the contact in the same period. As briefly mentioned in the previous episode, the Volga Kama appears to have been somewhat more developed than the southwest at this time. Several large metalworking centres without equivalents in the western forest steppe belt have been found here, as well as traces of smithies more generally, indicating that specialisation and therefore stratification, social class and hierarchy was starting to appear. The same is true of pottery. Some quite substantial finds of Persian silver and Byzantine goods have been discovered around the Kama dating from the 7th century, which have been linked to Turkic groups moving into the area while maintaining trade connections through the Western Turk Empire. Although these finds may indicate local elites, it is highly unlikely that any Turkic aristocracy at this time would base its status on holding land. At the forest belt end of the region, we have the remains of fortified settlements. Interestingly, not on the south side, which is taken as implying that the residents of the region were related to the peoples to their south. What was the threat to the north? It seems that no one really has an explanation of that, and some challenge the idea of these settlements being forts at all, seeing them rather as serving some kind of communal gathering social purpose. Agriculture was already practised, which was a bone of contention in the historiography for a while, as there was a prevailing theory for quite some time that nomadic groups such as the Bulgars did not move into areas that were already settled by peoples with developed agriculture. Recall that the Balkans were largely depopulated before the other Bulgars moved to the Danube. However, the accrual of evidence means that there is now no doubt that nomadic or semi-nomadic Bulgars did indeed move into an area where agriculture was already practised. According to the Muslim sources, the Bulgars also practised agriculture on a semi-nomadic basis, growing wheat, barley, leeks, lentils and beans in tilled fields that they travelled to in the summer, although Ibn Fadlan says, quote, their food is horse flesh and millet, although wheat and barley are plentiful, and whoever sows anything takes it for himself. The king has no right over it. End quote. Note particularly there that agricultural production was not taxed, in kind or otherwise. The sources are clear that the Khan derived his revenue from taxing commerce, taking a tenth of all goods travelling through his territory and by claiming a share of the booty from any war or raiding. Even where he and his warriors did not personally take part in the raid. So, as I already mentioned several waves of migration, let's take a look at how Bulgars started their move to the Volga. This means jumping back a little to the early days of the Khazars. As we've already covered, following the death of Kubrat, and the ensuing succession struggle among his sons, the Khazars took control of the North Caspian, ending old Great Bulgaria, and very likely bringing most of the Bulgar population into the Khayanat as tributaries. There seems to be some evidence that a large group of them was living around Balanjar, one of the two original capitals of the Khazars, which is linked to one of the major tribes in the Volga Bulgars the Baranjar. Others, as we've already covered, were pushed into a more sedentary existence in Crimea, successfully converting to a mixed pastoralist agricultural lifestyle in the peninsula. 
The establishment of the Khazar Khanate was soon followed by the Arab Khazar Wars, and as you will recall, the Transcaucasian area, including Balanjar, was where much of the conflict took place, eventually resulting in the abandonment of the city and the Khazars shifting their capital north to Atil on the lower Volga. The Bulgars of Balanjar followed this move north of the Caspian, as they naturally wanted to get out of the way of the Arabs too. The wars continued until Marwan's successful invasion of Khazaria in 737, where he forced the Quran to accept Islam. As we have heard, this did not stick, and the Arabs were unable to enforce it, essentially having to give up on really defeating the Khazars and any plans they had to enter Europe from the east. But there seems to be a suggestion in Islamic sources that they were actually more successful with the Bulgars, and it was the Kayan's subsequent conversion to Judaism a few years later that may have been the trigger for the first wave of Bulgar migration north towards the central Volga. In terms of timeline, this fits the archaeological record, which shows clear evidence of Turkic migration into the region in the second half of the 8th century where they would take around 100 years to achieve dominance over the existing inhabitants. It also matches up with what the archaeological record seems to show in that these Bulgars were at the least still semi-nomadic and established settlements in the same kind of riverside sites that we have seen steppe nomads using for the last couple of thousand years and practicing a lifestyle that was still preponderantly pastoralist rather than agrarian, which is how the Khazar Confederacy was still living at that time. The remains of temporary camps that would have accompanied the herds have also been found. Over the same period, the graves that they left behind transitioned from typical steppe pagan burials through the acquisition of certain Muslim elements to essentially Muslim-style cemeteries which is what we would expect to see, as they, should, as they would have been newly converted, and burial rituals generally take a few generations to assimilate major changes. However, against this, we need to note that, as in other conversions of steppe peoples, Islam would most likely have become prevalent among the Bulgar before the Khan converted. Some Muslim sources name a Khan Almish ruling after the establishment of Volga Bulgaria as the leader who officially converted the Bulgars to Islam. According to the Muslim travellers, the Bulgars preserved a semi-nomadic lifestyle for a long time. The Khan is described as living in a brick palace, but forbidding anyone else to build in stone or brick. Instead, the people lived in felt tents, probably similar to yurts. Istakhri comments, that although they had extensive farmland, they had no villages. After wintering in the towns, on the banks of the Volga and other waterways, they would go out in the summer to cultivate crops, in a similar way to the semi-nomadic Khazars around Atil. By the time Ibn Fadlan reached the Volgas, they had a reputation as Muslims and he and other Islamic writers comment that they already had mosques and Islamic schools, even if they did not appear to know all the right Islamic laws. On the other hand, he also says that although the ruler of Bulgaria was Muslim, his father had been a pagan, and there are other clues in the text that while Muslims may have been dominant, Islam was far from universal among the Bulgars. Some scholars have speculated that Bulgar merchants played up their Islamicness for a favourable treatment from trading partners. Ultimately, we do not have enough evidence to say for sure, but it is a convenient theory that seems to fit what we do know quite well, including that the Khazars extended their rule northwards after subduing the Pontus in an attempt to bring the Volga trade under their control. There is no archaeological evidence for large-scale trade from the forest to the Islamic world, 
before the Bulgars. The subsequent waves of migration are somewhat easier to link to other movements in the region. The Magyars moved south, and then the Pechenegs moved into the Pontic steppe, pushing the Magyars on to establish Hungary. These incursions caused the Bulgars remaining in the Pontus to move north to join their compatriots in the central Volga region and are part of the final consolidation of Volga Bulgaria. Islamic sources name five tribes among the Bulgars. The Bulgar themselves, the Sawa or Sabah, Basula, Askal and Baranjar. Ibn Fadlin names the leader of the Bulgar as the king of the Bulgars, with four sub-kings under him. The names Bulgar and Askal are not regarded as problematic by historians. They are well-attested Turkic peoples. But the others cause rather more discussion. The Baranjar, as we have already heard, can most likely be linked to Balanjar, the former Khazar capital, while the Suwa, which was also the name of a prominent city in Volga, Bulgaria, are linked to the Sabirs, a tribe who crop up a lot in connection with the early Khazars. Linguistically, as already mentioned in previous episodes, they spoke languages from the Oghuric branch of Turkic, as the Khazars also most likely did, of which Chuvash is now the only surviving representative. The languages of the other branch, Common Turkic, have a fairly high level of mutual intelligibility, while Chuvash is sufficiently different that its affiliation to the Turkic group was a matter of considerable debate prior to modern methods of linguistic analysis. We have only very few remains of the Bolga language. Although they were literate and there are references to poets and historians, the texts have not survived. All we have are some coins, copies of Samanid dirhams, and some later tomb inscriptions from the 13th and 14th centuries. These subscriptions are made in Arabic as well as Turkic and contain words now found in Chuvash. And if you are wondering why modern Tatar is a common Turkic language, the answer will involve the Golden Horde and another Turkic people called the Kipchaks. The Chuvash, neighbours of modern Volga Tatars, also partially trace their origins to the arrival of the Bulgars. The name Chuvash itself is a later coinage, usually treated as deriving from Suva, which in turn derives from Sabir. The Sabirs are a somewhat mysterious people who crop up all over the place, but always seem to be either in a secondary role or referred to by another name like Huns. They appear to have originated in southern Siberia towards the end of the BCE period and to have been ancestors of the ancient Ugrians. Variants of the name occur, Sibir, Siovir, Sabir. There are Hanti tribal groups using the names Sabir, Saper and Sopo. There is a town called Suva near the city of Tobolsk in Siberia where there were a people who called themselves the Sibir until the 14th century. Samoyedic peoples in Siberia called the previous inhabitants of their region Sebir. And if I tell you that the Russian for Siberia is Sibir, I think you will not find it hard to make the connection. Living at the southern edge of the forest belt, it was natural that they would come into contact with the steppe although it is impossible to trace the exact process by which it happened. By the 5th century CE, they are mentioned in Persian, Byzantine and Armenian sources, along with Ugrian tribes, Alans and Avars. Jordanus names them as one of the tribes in the Hun confederation. Over the next few centuries, some Sabirs migrated to the Don to become part of the Saltiv culture. Some remained in the Caucasus as the quote-unquote 
Caucasian Huns, and others were integrated into the Khazar Khayanate. Some scholars argue that the Khazars as such, the people of that name rather than the whole tribal confederation, were Sabias. Others argued that in the cases where they became Huns or Avars, this is an example of extending the name of a ruling tribe to cover others in a confederation. These Sabias, either in confederation with the Bulgars or sometime shortly after them, also migrated north into the central Volga region, where, as the Suvar, which is taken to be a Turkization of Sabia, they were one of the tribes making up the Bulgars. With a town called Suvar existing in the south of Volga Bulgaria, and the head of the Suvars being one of the four sub kings under the Khan. The emergence of the Chuvash as a distinct people will take place in Volga Bulgaria between the 10th and 15th centuries, when Volga Bulgaria was also the overlord of the Cheremis, Vortyaks, and Mordvins. In this period, Sabir Suvar fades from use as the name of a people, although it remains preserved in numerous place names throughout the region, as well as personal and family names among the peoples of the regions. By the time Khan Ibrahim took a census of the Khanate of Kazan in 1469, Chuvash were numbered among the hill people on the right bank of the Volga. According to Anton Salman's Sabir's Bulgars Chuvash, the ancestors of the Chuvash had three homelands. Quote, the first was the basin of the river Tobol, with the town of Sibir as its centre. The second was a part of the Khazar Kayana with the city of Varachan. The third was the basin of the Chiramshan, the southern district of today's Chuvash Republic and the northern parts of Ulyanovsk Oblast. The Sabirs who had become the Chuvash were established in this region as confederates of the Bulgars by 922. Today, there are around 1.5 million Chuvash with 90% of them living in the Russian Federation. Small populations in Kazakhstan, Ukraine and Uzbekistan, and a few thousand individuals scattered across the world, including around 1,000 Chuvash in the United States. So we will be following their story through until the end of this podcast. I think we have come across the term Pax something or other in the course of this podcast. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Pax Romana, and the term has also been used for several steppe empires that imposed a time of stability and mutually beneficial trade, most notably the Pax Mongolica. But we also had around 200 years of the Pax Khazarica, the height of the Khazar Khayanate where their dominance blocked new nomad incursions from the steppe. This ended with the Pechenegs crossing the Volga into the west, as recorded in contemporary Byzantine sources. So who were the Pechenegs? The Pechenegs were a Turkic people who appear to have spoken a language from the Oghuz branch, so related to the common Turkic family dominant today. Pecheneg itself has died out, but the names they gave to their tribal provinces were recorded by Constantine Porphyrogenitus in the area they eventually took up residence in on both sides of the southern Dnieper. We are talking classically obvious steppe tribal names here. No great creativity at work. Yavdi Erdem, the Erdem of the Shining Horses. Kurchi Chur, the Chur of the Blue Horses. Kabukshin Yula, the Yula of the bark-coloured horses. Surukul Bay, the Kul Bay of the grey horses. Kara Bay, the Bay of the black horses. Baru Tolmach, the Tolmach of the grey horses. The Yazi Kapyan, the Kapyan of the brown horses. And the Bula Chopan, the Chopan of the piebald horses. It's clear these people thought their horses were a really big deal. Mm-hmm. 
Incidentally, these names threw me a bit of a curveball, as I have been assuming the whole time that all these blue wolves, blue goats, blue horses, and so on, actually meant grey animals, which can look bluish in a certain light. But here we have grey and blue horses. So I looked it up, and at least in English, two kinds of horse are referred to as blue. The first is a blue-black, which is a horse with a black coat that does not fade. The second is a blue rowan. A rowan is a horse that has a coat of evenly interspersed white and non-fading coloured hairs, especially reddish-brown, or in the case of a blue rowan, black. Google these and you will see that they do indeed appear distinctly bluish. Naturally, all these references to fading and non-fading led me further, and I found that grey horses are actually born as any colour, with the greying setting in soon after birth if they carry a particular gene. I don't know how this lines up with steppe colour schemes or celestial blue wolves, but there is at least some likelihood that they used a similar classification. The Pechenegs originated in the region that is now Tajikistan. And as part of the fallout from the collapse of the Western Tjork, they ended up between the Ural and Volga rivers. From there, they made regular raids for slaves into neighbouring territories and sold those slaves to the Khazars. Their neighbours likewise raided them for slaves and also sold them to the Khazars. The Khazars blocked them moving further west and named them as a tributary people as late as Kayan Joseph's letter. But eventually the slave raids seemed to have reached unacceptable levels, and the Khazars allied with another Turkic group in the region, the Uz, to attack the Pechenegs. The Pechenegs were driven west, entering the region between the Kuban and the Upper Danets in the second half of the 9th century, and driving out the Madyars who had been living there. Sources suggest there was a split in this period, with the Pechenegs further east on the Kuban, remaining under Khazar control, while those on the Danets and Dnieper were independent. These independent Pechenegs became Byzantine clients and were used to fight against other peoples that Constantinople considered more of a threat, such as the Magyars and the Rus, as well as to generally undermine Khazar hegemony. The Danube Bulgarian Tsar, Simeon I, also entered into an alliance with the Pechenegs against the Magyars, and it was this alliance that ultimately defeated the Magyars in the Ukrainian steppe and forced them to migrate into Pannonia, where they would establish Hungary. The Pechenegs remained largely in control of the southwestern steppe for the next couple of hundred years as a significant rival of the Rus but did not make the transition from tribal raiders to statehood. Still, they are going to be appearing in our story repeatedly in coming episodes. The initial origin of the Magyars remains a matter of debate and conflicting theories with scholars placing them all across the Urals, Western Siberia and the Volga region. We know they have Ugrian roots, although, as you have probably guessed, they had close relations with the Turkic peoples, and to a lesser extent, the Slavs. The Hungarian language split from the others in the Ugrian family, sometime between 1000 and 500 BCE. By the 5th century CE, the Magyars were established west of the southern Urals, in the area that is now Bashkortostan and Perm Krai. Sometime around the early 8th century, they split, and some moved south into the Kuban. These are the Magyars that would eventually be driven off into Pannonia to form Hungary. The war with the Bulgarians, in which Tsar Simeon allied with the Pechenegs, started because Byzantium hired the Magyars to attack the Bulgarians in connection with a commercial dispute. The imperial fleet ferried the Magyar army across the Danube, where they defeated the Bulgarians and then returned home. The Bulgarians then either persuaded the Pechenegs to join them against the Magyar, 
or joined in with the Pechenegs who had already attacked them from the other side. Interestingly, despite centuries without contact, they retained the memory that some of their people had remained behind near the Urals, and eventually set the story down in their chronicles. In 1235, so around 400 years later, a group of Hungarian Dominicans, including a man named Friar Julian, was sent to find them. Upon reaching Volga, Bulgaria, he was informed that the Magyars lived only a couple of days' travel away, and when he reached them, he found that despite the centuries of separation, their languages remained mutually intelligible. So he named their homeland Magna Hungaria. He also started hearing rumours about some people called the Tatars, off in the east. Two years later, he returned to Magna Hungary to find it destroyed by the Mongol Tatars, and swiftly returned to Hungary, bringing the West its first warning of the coming invasion. However, the Hungarians lie outside of our story, at least until the 20th century, so the Magyars will only be playing a cameo role in future episodes. Returning to the questions I asked at the beginning of the previous episode, as to if or how the East differed from the West during the transition from antiquity to the medieval period, we can see that conditions varied across the region, and so there is no definitive answer. The parts of the region most closely integrated with the Eastern Roman Empire around the Black Sea, did not experience anything like the turmoil of the West. On the contrary, they continued to grow and develop strongly from the 6th century onwards. Towards the Balkans, the region experienced considerable depopulation after the Huns, with new peoples migrating into the empty land to replace them. Historians often compare this region to the experience of Britain after the Romans left. The old institutions fell into decay, and a peasant society based around villages with communal agriculture appeared. But the feudal features of a landed aristocracy and a rent-based economy would take time to develop. This can also be extended north into the western edge of the steppe and the forest steppe belt, where the eastern Slavs and sedentarizing steppe tribes were also developing an agricultural society based on villages and communal agriculture. There was no tax system to disappear here, and little sign of social stratification, specialization, private property outside of personal effects, a military elite, or other aspects of feudal society. Further north and east, we do find those first signs of specialization, stratification, and the military class starting to appear. But across the region as a whole, the dominant forces of the Khazars, and more locally the Bulgars on the central Volga, continue to have a structure based on traditional steppe practices. Their rulers fund their courts and armies through levies on trade and war booty, not rights to land. And although they too are developing agriculture, they are not peasants and do not live in villages. Perhaps most importantly at this stage, The institution that in the West attempts to step into the gap left by the fading empire as a new unifying force, the Church, is still missing. But it will soon be coming, and that will open up a whole new series of questions on how and why the East differed from the West. But that is a subject for later. Join me next episode as we meet the Varangians. Most listeners to this podcast are, as you might expect, in the English-speaking countries of the world. The United Kingdom has the second biggest audience, but unlike Americans, Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders, none of you has left a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're enjoying the show and you have a minute to spare, every five-star review or rating helps new listeners find us. Each episode has an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss, and sources. You can find them through the link in the show notes or on the website at 
the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter, or Facebook, or email to hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you.